hopefully this will work. So, uh, okay, so today uh, we have Alpha Teixeira from the University of Sheffield. Uh, uh, she's a last year PhD student. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Uh, and today she's going to talk about the dark side of the cosmological function. Thank you. So first, thank you for uh, inviting me. I'm very happy to be here and everyone has been so nice and kind to really good. And uh, so yes, I'm a PhD student at the University of Sheffield. I'm a supervised by Carson van der Broek. And, and I'm going to talk about this work in the archive number over there that I did during my uh, first year of PhD and the follow-up that we're working on uh, at the moment. So just to give some context, uh, at the moment we have our standard model of cosmology, which is the lambda CDM model uh, that we all know assumes this kind of distribution. I'll explain very shortly. Um, and the idea is that we found this overwhelming um, evidence for the accelerated expansion of the universe, first from supernovae. Uh, alone, and now this evidence seems to come from other sources, so it's quite a robust result. And so this, this model relies on three, let's say, standard pieces of physics, which would be our nice theory of gravity, general relativity. Uh, then we will have to have a metric hands up based on assumptions we make about the universe. So we usually work with the FLRW metric that assumes um, homogeneity and isotropy in the universe. And then we have the standard model that also appears in the standard model of particle physics that we all observe. So those would be barriers, photons, neutrinos, etc. Then to make this model work, we have to introduce three pieces of, let's say, new physics that we have to introduce by hand in the model. So there will be uh, some something to explain this late time acceleration that is not predicted just based on GR. So for this, in the lambda CDM model, we use what's called the cosmological constant, so this lambda. Uh, there are ex extensions for what this could be. So it could be a scalar field, it could be modified gravity, other, other options. Uh, then we need inflation to explain the problems in the early universe. Uh, and that would be primarily considering an infraton field. But as we know, we also have different fields with different uh, potentials or even contributions from different sources. And then, which we can already read over there, um, we have another piece of new physics, which is the cold dark matter that we also assume is just a little interacting uh, particle, but it can also be generalized to be a scalar field, let's say an axion, or can even be part of the primordial black hole as well. Uh, something can have other explanations. So this to say that this is the standard model at the moment, but there is still quite some freedom when it comes to these pieces of, of new physics that we just take to be the simplest possible explanations. So on that side, the model is just based on theoretical simplicity. And so usually when we want to study this model against observation, we will have six, when I say six ingredients, it's more of six free parameters that we try to constrain with the data. And I'll talk a bit more about those further on. But we have these six ingredients. Um, and mainly, we make this big assumption that we have the cosmological constant, which is just a fluid that basically doesn't um, dilute uh, with the expansion. So it remains constant as, an universe, as the universe expands. Now, um, this model is great. It does an outstanding fit to the plant data for the temperature and isotropies, especially at large multiples. So you see that the peak is really, really impressive. Uh, and most of the uncertainties are, <laughs> are here, right? Uh, where the error bars are much bigger than in the rest because these are the lower scales. And so we have less uh, statistical sampling for these. Um, and are also the scales that can be more vulnerable to effects uh, such as 
uh, dark energy effects or even uh, cold dark matter um, effects. But in any case, impressive fit to the CMB temperature and azotropies. But as I said in the name of the talk, we have these observational tensions that um, I would say a few five years ago, maybe not as much even, uh, have become quite a uh, robust uh, area of research. So mainly, uh, by, I think most people will be familiar with the Hubble tension. And so the Hubble tension is what's summarized here in this plot. And it's basically just saying that we can uh, have measures of uh, the Hubble parameter, so parameterizing the expansion, our H0. So we can have measures of H0 coming indirectly from the early universe. So meaning that we take fit with some the early universe, and then we use our model to propagate those things that we measure to infer values for things in the late universe, such as H0. And that would be mainly uh, Planck uh, in things like BAO. So I think people usually assume that BAO is model independent, but it's not really because BAO was, um, is emitted or measured from the early universe when there's still a strong coupling between photons and baryons. And so in the same way, we have to propagate the physics until the late universe when we measure them in the power spectrum, especially. Then we have what are our late time uh, probes for H0, and those, this would be just, let's say, based on distance measures. And so since these are quite local objects that are calibrated astrophysically, let's say like CEPIs, that are then used to calibrate supernovae, which is the one, the value that I indicated here, which is one of the most robust values that we see here that has the smallest error bars. Uh, and it's also made from a collection of a thousand and something supernovae. But the, the really important thing here is that there's a clear trend that separates the measurements in the old universe that predict a lower value. So for instance, Planck, uh, predicts 67.4 for the best fit value uh, and the late universe probes uh, that measure much higher values in particular the supernovae it was 70 around 74. so this is at least a five sigma discrepancy which is not great statistically speaking um, and as more and more data gets collected it becomes harder to explain this just based on statistical errors or systematic errors, because then you would need systematics coming from, let's say, calibration of CEPIs, calibration of people of the red giant branch stars or calibrations of supernovae. So you would need to account for many different things to explain uh, these discrepancies. So in general, the claim here is that since there's a big magnitude in the sense that is around five sigma, and also persistence between early and late time measurements. Um, this could hint at standard model flaws or, or the need for new physics, basically because in the late in the late universe, these measures will be quite model independent, and in the early universe, they will be very model dependent. So there could be a problem in the model. Okay, then there we, we have another another tension, which is called the SA tension. So S8 is this parameter over here that basically relates sigma eight, which is just in some way the scale of the matter power spectrum today. Uh, and then we have all the matter here. So from weak lensing measurements, it's quite well understood that this tension is really on S8 and not on sigma eight. And so this means that there could be problems in the way um, omega matter is being uh, parameterized. And one of the reasons is because the DAO measurements, as I said at the beginning, they are quite model dependent as well, or it's not clear whether it's they are model independent. Um, and they, they have strong constraints from omega matter because they will tell us information about how matter coupled uh, with protons. And so there could also be problems uh, in, the, in the matter side. Now, this tension is not as big as the um, as I tension, so it's around three sigma, uh, especially if we take again 
measures from the early universe, so that would be Planck, for instance. Uh, and then if we take a galaxy clustering data or we cleansing data, which will give us smaller values for uh, for the um, SA parameter. So in general, if we want to explain this, for instance, using Planck, then we would need Planck to give us a higher value for each norm and also a lower value for Planck, which can be quite difficult to do because we would mess with two parameters that are strongly correlated, which are each norm and the other one. Exactly, so they are correlated. So the claim is that we can make extensions to the standard model and try to see whether they indicate that there could be some missing physics in a particular sector of the evolution of the universe. So to give an idea, I showed before how um, Blanda CVM with Planck data gives a great fit to the temperature and isotropies. And why do, do we consider taking different uh, different models or extensions to the model. The idea is that when we do any kind of statistical sampling on the parameters of the model, if we use, for instance, Planck, what we are doing is effectively we are taking all the realization of the parameters in the model and then seeing what's the shape of the power spectrum or the spectrum of temperature ideology that we get and find the combination that fits the data better. Now, if we make some modifications in the model, so these are just generic examples, like if we consider non-flat cosmologies uh, evolving, kind of evolving mass energy, changes in the coupling to variants, matter, we will have, we can have different effects in how the temperature power spectrum changes. So for instance, we could have cases in which most of the changes will be in the low multiple tail. We could have cases in which we'll have an enhancement of the um, of the first peak, or we can have a suppression of the first peak. So each contribution of new physics will give us different fits to the power spectrum. And for instance, it would even give us a better fit uh, than on the CDM. So here on the right, it's just a collection made in this recent paper of different uh, models, uh, extensions to the CDM. Most of them with Planck or Planck combined with other data and seeing. So this is not very clear, but we have here, here, the value for lambda CVM, which is the one intention with the one we have in shoes, which we can also not really see from the supernovae, but it's here in blue, light blue. Uh, and we see that by adding a few ingredients to the standard model, we can. Uh, in some way, shift uh, the value of the prediction for H0, sometimes at the cost of other parameters. And I should say that at the moment, there is no agreed model that solves uh, both the tensions and has a statistical support. So, my claim here is that this could be um, due to missing ingredients or new physics. And so, what we do is we formulate toy models which in my opinion, don't have to be true models. So this would be just models that would give us an idea of where we should be looking at. So which sector of the composition of the universe, which part of the history, which kind of components. So there are many extensions and this, especially lately has been studied very extensively in the literature. So typical extensions that we can make will be very uh, effective number, having dynamical dark energy, early dark energy, uh, dark matter, axion, dark matter, modified gravity. So the possibilities are literally endless. Um, but one thing that's important is because we know that there's this discrepancy between the late and the early universe. We know that something has to change in the early universe. So we cannot just have some kind of late time modification that would give us maybe a large range node, but it will still keep the tensions because we know that this will start in the early universe and they will propagate towards the late universe. Um, so it's not just about proposing a model and then coming here and seeing how well it fits 
that you know so it also has to explain the Hubble flow up until today. So usually we say that we want a model that can have late time modifications, but also early time modifications in the sense of predicting the larger age not, but predicting a smaller sound horizon so that we can also account for the essay tension and even for the Hubble tension to avoid, so to have an explanation for this larger value of age not that comes from propagating from the early universe and not just from the late universe. Okay, so here I'm basically going to consider models that have this interaction between dark energy and dark matter. And I'm going to explain why. Why? Because it's my PhD topic. <laughs> <laughs> and but the problem here is that most of the um, most of the interacting dark energy and dark matter models would introduce modifications in the late universe, which is not what, what we want. Um, because we know that dark energy only becomes important in the late universe. And so this coupling will only, in principle, bring differences in the late universe. And in fact, all the late universe models I have studied give terrible results. The one I'm going to show also, spoiler, no good results. <laughs> but it's seeing what kind of ingredients we can add and whether these make, make it uh, better. So basically what we do is we choose a model and model as we saw there are endless models then we do a numerical study of the model just by doing some simulations to see uh, what parameters seem to be leading us uh, in the way that we would hope to solve the tensions and this allows us to define some statistical priors so saying okay this this parameter should be in this range to be physically viable and then we do a statistical analysis to the sampling of the parameters. Uh, and then on top of that, even if the model gives a better value for H naught, we have to use some statistical indicator to assess whether our model has more statistical support than on the CDM model, especially because in principle we'll be introducing extra parameters. And of course, if we have extra parameters, the model can become more predictive. So we can also, we should also account for that more predictive in the sense that it becomes more accommodating, right? Because if you have more parameters, the parameters can take a broader range of values and so can in principle give not everything we want, but yeah, broader predictions. Okay, so now controversial part, <laughs> which is one way to introduce these couplings is we can just assume they're there and introduce them in the field equations by hand, uh, or we can try to find a way to motivate them uh, from the Lagrangian formulation. Uh, and one way to do this is to assume that this model can be connected in some way to a modified gravity theory, and that this is described by means of some transformation of the metric that depends on the scalar field, and that couples non-minimally to the matter Lagrangian and not uh, to the um, gravity side. So it happens minimally to gravity. And in this way, we just guarantee that we are not messing uh, with the gravitational part, uh, but instead we are seeing something that could change in the way matter evolves in the universe um, and seeing how this affects the, the equation. So uh, yes, I will explain this better. But basically, we will have one metric that is the gravitational metric that enters a uh, magnetic attraction. And then we will have another related metric uh, that defines uh, the propagation of the matter fields. Okay, so then how do we do this? So there's the famous conformal transformation, which is uh, the simplest way to relate to geometries in the sense that we are just taking a rescaling. So we are just multiplying by a function. And in this sense, uh, we keep, uh, we preserve angles and uh, we guarantee uh, that the metric is still Lorentzian, but we have this dependence here on phi. And so they will both be uh, related by how phi is, phi is evolving uh, in the gravitational metric. Um, why is this good? Because if we already have the scalar field in the theory, 
if we already have that chemistry to be that into the stellar field, then we can just uh, use the same stellar field to say that there is this effective interaction between the two that comes from the fact that the geophysics of dark matter or matter uh, will depend uh, on the stellar field. And that naturally gives rise to, to the coupling. So these have been uh, very famous in the literature, you see, since the 60s, basically because they uh, preserve the structure of stellar cancer theories when you take um, theories of the jordan brunswick key form, um, like F of R. So we will have a way to map from modified gravity to uh, dark energy models. Now, even more controversial, <laughs> then we have the so-called disformal transformation, um, in which we take our conformal part, but then we add something else that depends. It's not just a simple rescaling of the metric, but now depends uh, on derivatives of the scalar field. So this may seem a bit ad hoc, but uh, in fact, what can be shown is that it's, it's now instead of considering from Brunswick kind of theories, we consider Modesky theories, which are the modified gravity theories that still give us uh, second order equations of motion, uh, we find that the form of these Lagrangian is preserved under these transformations. So that's why uh, this uh, form is chosen and it has been used in many cosmological applications. So I'm just going to give an example of one. Um, so in terms of interacting that like energy, the simplest case is to have a quintessence scalar field, which is just a canonical scalar field that is propagating in the universe uh, and gives us a time varying um, dark energy. And so we can take, we see here in this graph, um, there's no conflict of interest. This is my supervisor. <laughs> uh, in this plot, we see that we can have conformal, disformal, or mixed. So when we say disformal, in this case, it's just saying that we don't have this part, we have just this component, and mixed, we have the two. And we see that when we have the conformal, this coupling is constant throughout time. This is the coupling, this is time. So where is the expression of the coupling? Is it on the previous slide? Ah, uh, no, I haven't shown it. I, I, I will turn. But the idea is just, it's just a constant because basically we will make a derivative and then we will have just a constant in the coupling that I will, I'll show for the disformal case. Um, yes, so it is constant throughout time. And this, is problematic because it means that we have very strong constraints coming from the early universe and also from the map dominated epoch. And so this means that this coupling will be constrained to be very small, um, also because of solar system tests uh, today. Then, if you consider just this formal, which is the one here, might also be problematic because in the past we can have very high values of this coupling and disrupt um, structure formation. But if we have a mixed coupling, it could be that in the past we have some zero, uh, we have some non-zero coupling, uh, we have some zero coupling that evolves, may change sign even, and then today have a certain value that we can probe according uh, to the experiments. Yes. Okay, but this doesn't work, and why? Because usually for all the cases, we will have very drastic. Departures, uh, departures in the formation of structures, exactly because of what we saw here, because this can be quite problematic. Um, also, again, as I was saying, if you perform um, um, sampling analysis, so a Monte Carlo Markov chain analysis, which I will explain as well, uh, we find that longer CDM is still preferred by the data. So there's no reason to take all these extra parameters. Uh, and also, usually, what we do is to assume that this scalar field is coupling only to dark matter because we know that we have very strong constraints on couplings to variants, um, especially in the solar system, and also uh, because of the constraints on the speed of gravitational waves that rule out a lot of modified gravity models. So, this is assumed, and again, there's no clear reason why this coupling should be non-universal, why it should couple only to dark matter. Um, moreover, we have these two functions, 
CND for the conformal in the formal coupling that can basically be anything, right? So we have a big functional freedom. We could take any function and in principle, we could get a lot of types of uh, couplings. So then I have here a few questions, which is first, we would like to have a way to motivate this setting theoretically, right? Instead of just saying, okay, I transform the metric and see what happens. Also, um, we would like to explain how this coupling is not, why is it not universal. Also, we would like to have a form for C and D that also has physical motivation. It's not just uh, say that it's an exponential because it's simple. Uh, and also, if we could address the tension by having a coupling that is significant, not only at late times, but that doesn't disrupt uh, structure formation uh, as much. Okay, now even more controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, these are the people to blame, if you want to blame, not me. Uh, there is this model that has been proposed in the literature, which is called the dark D brain model. Uh, and this is basically a model uh, based on string theory. So Yvonne Zavala is an expert on string theory and probably do so mostly on modified gravity. Um, and in this setting, uh, we have the universe described as a higher dimensional uh, bulk. So it would be all of this. And then we have to imagine that we will have what is called visible grains, which here I have just one, but it could be multiple, uh, which are basically grains of lower dimensions that can be contained uh, in the bulk or they can have the same dimensions, uh, but at least they should have three special dimensions, which are the ones we observe. And in this brain, we will have everything that we know and we measure, so the standard model particles and uh, their interactions. And then we will have some other brain, or set of brains, called the dark D brain, uh, in which we say where the dark things live. So it's like the prison to where we send that matter and that energy. And so this could explain why we only measure interactions of the standard model, and we only measure that energy and that matter to the gravitational interactions because gravity will be the force propagating in the bulk. And so because the standard model interactions are all contained here, that matter and that energy cannot interact uh, with the standard model particles. They can only interact between themselves here, and then we observe those effects uh, gravitationally through the interaction with the, with the bulk. So in this case, that matter will be the matter fields that exist in this brain. And the nice property is that we don't have to introduce anything besides the setting itself, which is that if we consider that this brain is moving in the extra dimensions, we would have a scalar field already in the theory which is a scalar field that parameterizes the motion of the brain. So this is called the gradient scalar field. Um, and it can be shown, well, I'll just give you then the action, but that this rad, uh, radion scalar field actually has a dirac warning felt uh, character, which I've also explained. But the main point is that it will introduce non-canonical terms in the, in the interaction. But a nice feature is that we find exactly that this setting naturally includes an induced metric, because if this brain is moving and is separated from that one, there will be an induced metric coming from the motion of the brain in the extra dimensions and the interaction with gravity. And we find that uh, this uh, induced metric is actually a, this formal transformation. And in particular, the function C and D are not free and they are um, related to the what's called the work factor of the brain, which is basically a way of compactifying the extra dimensions in the in the brain. Why does why does the brain have to be moving? I mean, if the brain is just sitting still and uh, it's got all its dark sectors that are going to interact, and we're going to feel the gravitational pull of the that that dark sector from from a distance in the bulk. Why is that not a viable scenario? That's a good question. Mostly because we want to have something to probe, and then if the brain is moving, we can exactly probe 
the effect it has on gravity that we can measure from here. Because if it's not moving, whatever is happening here, we cannot we cannot see it because we can only see the gravitational effects. And so for there to be gravitational effects, there has to be some interaction to, with the bulk. Mm -hmm. So that interaction will be given in terms of mm -hmm. uh, the motion in the external motion. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm not the biggest expert <laughs> on string theory. So what actually what's happening on the on the on the dark brain is actually pretty irrelevant. The really the relevant thing that is transmitted to us is the fact that there's this this mass in the extra dimension that is moving. And uh, you feel the disturbance of the bulk metric. Yes, and you feel that according to how the dimensions of the brain or the, the extra dimensions will be warped in the sense that since here we are assuming that there's still only four dimensions, we will need to have some kind of growth that is warped. So that could have more dimensions, but it's reduced because it has some more function that includes uh, these these dimensions. Um, and the idea is that the type of warping would also tell us what kind of interactions it can have with the <coughs> bulk. And that will come from this uh, function here, which is called the warp factor. Basically tell you what kind of, let's say, what kind of gravity you will have here. So it can be something like uh, ABS5, or it can be something more complicated, like in type 2B, in theory, these kind of things. But it will just tell you basically how the extra dimensions are compacted by. Can I just ask a question which follows on from Tessa's? Um, I mean, the whole point of brain cosmology is that the brain is actually moving, whereas, of course, in the Randall Sundgren picture, it's not moving. So, so your 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 statement that it's moving—I mean, that isn't that necessarily true within a cosmological context? Yes, exactly. Because otherwise, we also wouldn't have interactions with with gravity or with the world. So, in practice, if it was not moving, it would be like an, something that is totally disconnected from us, right? Yes, that was my understanding. But I, I had I wasn't somehow familiar with the idea that one is explaining the dark energy by that motion. This is what was puzzling me a bit. That's that's not the the reason why this color field is there, it's just this proposal. So this proposal is saying now imagine that actually this color field that is parameterizing the motion happens to be the dark energy we observe because we already have a scalar field there and then see what happens. But, but, but in that model, does that relate, does that explain why the dark energy and the dark matter have such similar densities? Exactly. Yes, it does. Because then what happens is that because of doing this, because dark energy is actually the field that parameterizes the geometry uh, of the brain, then in this case, um, that matter would be the matter fields that propagate in this brain that would feel the effect of this warping factor. And so we would naturally explain uh, some sort of interaction between the two because this would just be geometrically motivated. So we have no control whatsoever in what, what comes out of this. Well, we can define the warp factor here, but it's not our choice to impose a coupling. The coupling is there because of the geometrical properties uh, mm. of the okay. okay, thank you very much for that clarification. Oh, thank you. And in particular, we will find what's called uh, scaling solutions, which is usually why we want to have couplings between dark energy and dark matter, because then through these scaling solutions, which is basically just saying that for a time of the universe, the evolution of the scalar field and the evolution of dark matter are proportional, they evolve at the same rate. And so that would uh, in some way explain why they have similar values uh, today. So just to see then what happens in this scenario, what happens is that by having this warping, we have some induced metric on the brain and we have a realization of this formal uh, transformation, which C depends on the warp factor with a factor of one half, minus one half, and D with a factor of one half. But in the end, this is a formal transformation, just that uh, we have no control over 
uh, the shape of CMB. So they are naturally coupled in this scenario. We don't have to impose the coupling. Uh, and what happens is that because uh, we have the separation between the brains, the metric that gives us the geodesics in the standard model particle here would be our gravitational metric, uh, G And then whatever the metric that gives us uh, the um, geodesics for dark matter particles in the dark field brain will not be the same. And in particular, will depend on this field. And the, the nice thing is that the coupling is non universal by construction of the geometrical setting. So we don't have to say, okay, dark, dark energy couples only to dark matter because we have decided so, but it's naturally from uh, the setting that we have here. And in this way, we will avoid the problems that come with couplings to, to bios or to light. Okay, so then for the cosmology out of it, we end up with this metric in which basically uh, with this action in which basically we have standard time study over action. So this would be again like having a this form of transformation in the Einstein frame. Then we have the metric, uh, the action that is called exactly the dark deeper in action. So it's the action uh, for the motion uh, of the brain. And it so happens that this motion is parameterized uh, in terms of the scalar field. So we have the work factor over here. And in particular, this is also from an string theory when we have the dilator, which is in some way the same as the radion. And we end up with, instead of intensity, in which we have some kind of um, field theory generalization of an unrelativistic particle, we end up with, let's say, a field theory generalization of the relativistic particle, in which here we have some kind of Lorentz factor that parameterizes how um, how relativistic the scalar field is. Um, and the terms that, again, the terms that appear here will be non-trivial, but they are imposed by the string theory scenario when we choose the function and the work factor. Important point is that uh, this reduces to this, so this reduces to canonical frequencies in, of course, the non-relativistic limit, which in this case is saying that uh, age of phi, dnu phi, dnu phi is small, and then we can take a parallel expansion, and this term naturally uh, recover the canonical case. Then we have our standard model fields that are in the visible brain and so are naturally uncoupled. And then we have our uh, the action for uh, the um, dark matter uh, fields again for the dark field brain. And this will have to be described in terms of the metric, the induced metric, which will depend on the work factor because that's how and uh, where the dark matter fields are propagated. Okay, so this up until here, not my work, right? So this was already proposed here. Then what I did was study the cosmology out of this um, out of this action. So basically keeping a general work factor in the general self-interacting potential for the scalar field, we get equations that will reduce to the canonical case in the limit uh, where h in the phi in the phi uh, is small. We have some extra terms. So this delta is that kind of Lorentz factor that I mentioned. So we will have a lot of terms depending on the relativistic part of the scalar field and then some extra terms depending on the coupling, which again, doesn't really matter the functional form, just that uh, this depends on, so the reason why is here dividing and multiplying is because the coupling is usually defined with this rho c, so this would be the coupling, and then this theta, which is kind of an effective coupling, we remove the dependence on rho uh, c, but I left it there just so that it's clear. But what we see is that we have a strong dependence on the coupling coming from the work factors evolution and from the potential in law. Then we have to make a choice, right? Because then if we want to study the model, we need to have some kind of toy model. So the simplest case, and we so far have only considered this case, is assuming 
that we have an ideas five throat, just because this is the most common phase in CMPV and it's easier to study because we have just a power of for the word factor. Um, and when we do this, uh, this generates a quadratic potential of this form as well. It can be more complicated, but this leads to a nice property in which the combinations that we have here of H and V will mean that we can define a single key parameter, which is this gamma norm, which basically gives us the scale of the work factor and the scale of the potential, the combination of the two. And so the combination of the effect um, of the amplitude uh, of the stellar field functions. And this was studied through the um, dynamical systems analysis in the original work and shown that the fixed points that we find in this um, dynamical systems analysis in reality only depend on the combination. So in principle, we could think that um, it depends only on the combination. And then we find this nice property that I was saying that we have scaling solutions when that parameter is greater than one. These scaling solutions meaning that that matter and that can achieve or, or dilute at the same rate. And then we can justify why they have comparable ratios to that. Okay, so then I implemented the equations in um, Einstein Boltzmann solver to account for the whole evolution of the universe and see the impact um, of the coupling. So here I have used two examples just to show two features of the model. So because the coupling is quite complicated, it's hard to make generalizations. But basically, what we found was that there is also a dependence on the initial condition of the stellar field in the early universe. So basically how the brain was moving in the early universe. Um, and this coupling can be negative for large values of this initial condition. And this means that we have a transfer of energy for dark matter, from dark matter to dark energy. But then we can also have another regime we can have the opposite if I take very small values of phi mini, so it will be the same but positive. Um, but interestingly, what we can find is we can have cosmologies in which this coupling is zero throughout some period of the universe. It may peak at some non trivial time, and then today be very close to zero, meaning that we wouldn't be able to measure it or we would measure it with very low values. But okay, this is just. Theoretical. Then we can study the observables. So we see uh, that we get a nice scaling solution towards uh, the end of the evolution, maybe more clear here. Um, and we also have an enhancement, a general enhancement of the Hubble uh, in, the, in the evolution of the universe. So meaning that we are changing the Hubble's flow effectively not just if not, but keeping in mind that here the present cosmology is fixed. So whatever we see here is not necessarily what will happen if we make a sampling of the parameters. Yes. And this is basically the same information. So we will have an enhancement of the amount of matter of that matter in the universe in general. So here the thin lines Around the CDM, and the other lines are um, are the two examples that I have shown here. But the idea is basically uh, that if we see here, throughout most of the evolution of the universe, in these two cases, it will be dark matter granting energy to dark energy. And so, in order to have the same present value, we need to have an excess of dark matter during the evolution so that it loses energy and then actually it is the same. Uh, prediction. Okay, then just saying that we can uh, study the perturbations. I didn't even put here the expression because it's just not nice. But uh, one interesting thing, and that is a feature of also coupled quintessence with this form of coupling, is that uh, the perturbation of the coupling depends on k squared, so it depends on the scales. Is scale dependent, and so this will introduce non trivial uh, effects in the matter power spectrum. 
And in fact, what we find is that there is no overall suppression or enhancement of the matter for spectrum, but we will have a turn turnover point in which the scale becomes more or less important. And so the contribution of the coupling becomes less or more important. And we can have suppression or enhancement for small or large scales depending on the, on the parameters. And so now we can also have, we'll have the same effect uh, in the temperature anisotropies, spectrum of anisotropies. So we see here, for instance, that we have an enhancement uh, at low L and then a suppression uh, at high multiples. The same thing here. Uh, we have tiny enhancement here and a suppression over there. And this will also affect the shape of the peaks. And so it will be highly constrained uh, by the data. So it's always important that we find these distinctive signatures so that then we don't have the general seizing the values of the parameters and the model can actually be probed and distinguished from, um, from the CDM. Okay, this is basically the same information, but for the lensing, in which we have uh, here most a suppression at low uh, multiples and then an enhancement at high multiples. Okay, then just to show you the results in the last five minutes, uh, what we do is we then want to do a statistical analysis of the model. Okay, we have this model, it has some nice features, but it has some free parameters and we want to know whether these free parameters can accommodate for a better fit to the data. So to do this, we do a Bayesian analysis, which is just to say that we take the data that we have and we want to obtain what we call posteriors, which is basically just the distribution of the parameters given the data um, based on our prior knowledge of the parameters of the model. And so that's why it's so important to study the model numerically first so that we know which kind of parameter values are reasonable uh, for the sampling. So then again, not important, but uh, to do this, I modified an einstein boltzmann code and then I interfaced it with a statistical sample particular dose, and then I analyze the results with another Python and package. Um, I use the most standard data just for the first analysis, because then we can see what happens when we have just Planck, and then when we combine Planck with the most robust uh, late universe probes, and also seeing if adding some uh, lensing uh, measurements from Planck affects the results based on the lensing power spectrum. Um, to do so, we take uh, the usual six parameters of the CDM, and then we have our two parameters, which are basically this is the same as something that gamma naught because we will have a degeneracy between each node and gamma naught, and so it will be not. So the scales of the work are in the potential, and so we sample just one, and the other one we speaks to a shooting method in the um, cosmological evolution, and then also the initial condition. So we have six parameters plus two of our model, and the rest is fixed to one 2018 with the, the CDM. Okay, then sadly, what we find is that so the dashed lines are lambda CDM. We find that for all the data combinations, we have a lower prediction for H0, especially using one data alone. Uh, but a bit, but still consistent at one sigma for the other combinations. And here, what happens is that when we have just one, we have very broad predictions. And then when we have VAO and supernovae data, especially VAO because it's related uh, with uh, the coupling with matter in the early universe, it will give us very tight constraints on omega matter. And once that happens, all the other parameters get very tight constraints. Uh, or at least tighter constraints. And problem is that we also get, so we had a problem in S8 in which for frequency measurements it was around 0 0.7, and we had around 0 0.8 with Planck, and here we have around 1 <laughs> point something. So it actually <laughs> worsens the S8 tension. So it seems like everything is going in the wrong direction. Um, but the nice thing is that we find that this initial condition is constrained to be consistently 
of the order one Planck mass uh, and this parameter is also consistently um, around order 10 so having smaller values just with one and then for other possibilities uh, with the rest of the data because then we have a degeneracy between changing the value of the coupling or changing the value of uh, omega matter and if not uh, in the power spectrum maybe i'll just skip this for sake of time this is basically the same we have higher predictions um and this can be explained by the fact uh, that the in the numerical study that i showed before in all the cases maybe it's easier to see the background in all the cases when we take higher and higher values of gamma rod it seems like we approach lambda cvm so of course these are very exaggerated values just for the sake uh, of illustrating but if you see the purple line is always approaching on the cvm behavior because one of the problems of this model is that we don't have a well-defined on the cvm behavior because we cannot just set the warp factor to zero or to one um, and we can never recover properly on the cvm but it seems that as we increase this parameter we actually get less modifications and that is what we see here in the posteriors which is at some point the value of which not converges to the Planck value to the Planck predictions and then no matter how much we increase each non we get the same constraints so they are basically not correlated so this means that we approach some kind of on the CVM value uh, some kind of saturation point for this parameter uh, and we cannot obtain larger values for each node, right? Because it is expected that this keeps growing, but it doesn't. Um, yes, I just skip this one. Uh, and this is just the statistical analysis, just to say that when these statistical indicators are negative, it means that we have a support for our model over the CDM, um, in particular when it's bigger than five. So the data doesn't know about the tensions right so we won't care about the tensions but apart from that it seems to be giving some statistical evidence to this uh, given model over on the cdm even if it has two more parameters but uh, I, don't, I don't think just with these simple indicators we can claim this so we will have to do a more proper uh, statistical study okay so these are my conclusions basically what I want to say is that we have this framework motivated from some theory in which the dark sector has a joint geometrical origin, so we don't have to um, impose specific points. The, the premise was that maybe we could address some of the problems of this form of intensity and why uh, it doesn't work. So then we did a study with CMB uh, in Bowen Supernovi data. We found constraints on the parameters. I say that there's no clearly statistically favored model until we do a proper study. But in the end, we know that this doesn't address the tensions. So one possibility would be maybe to take another word factor because we took just the simplest case or another potential. But again, this would be uh, I don't know, it had to be, it has to be correctly motivated. And just finishing by saying that I think this is a very exciting time because now we will have Euclid being launched. And so we will finally be able to say whether there is um, convincing grounds for dark energy or even uh, dark energy interactions. And say that the uh, illustrations here were made together with my friend Inesh. <laughs> mm. um, hopefully they made it less painful to <laughs> listen to me. And if you want to see her work, uh, it's there. So, thank you.